So you can see my screen now, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Try to make it full screen, maybe. Like I don't want to go to presenter view because that messes up my secondary monitor. Um, okay, no worries. Yeah. Technology. Just gonna wait one minute, one, two minutes. There is a lot of people joining.
Okay, maybe we can start. Welcome everyone to this um, the fourth talk in this seminar series, this summer population genetic, uh, genetic seminar series. Um, so this is organized by EPIC, uh, which is a, a group of evolutionary biologists focusing on population genetics in Copenhagen. And uh, we hold mostly uh, monthly physical seminars um, when we can uh, featuring uh, the latest research of local researchers and visitors uh, and, and we have very nice discussions and, and we always end the, the day with pizza. So now we're holding this uh, seminar series that has been great so far. Uh, we have a mailing list. Uh, you can head to the um, website and, and check out the rest of the talks, uh, what the group is about. Uh, you can join the, the, the mailing list and keep uh, updated. And today we have um, Tyler, uh, well, sorry that. So this is the this is the entire um, program for the seminar series. Um, we are in the fourth talk now, and we have two left: uh, Lucy van Dor next Monday, and Anna Sapo Malaspinas next Friday. Um, today we have Tyler, Tyler Linderoth, <laughs> um, that is um, interested in statistical methods for analyzing genetic data. Uh, he works particularly in how adaptation and demography influence uh, phenotypic diversity. Did his PhD with Rasmus Nielsen, uh, developing methods for next generation sequencing, uh, mostly non model organisms, and currently is a postdoc at, at Richard Serbin's uh, lab um, and is working with East African uh, cyclists. Um, so, this is it. Um, so, the floor is yours, Tyler. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let's see. I uh, guess I need to do the sharing thing, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so can you see that then? Yeah. Oh boy. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot for letting me do this. Um, it's pretty cool, I'm honored. Um, and today I'd like to just tell you all about um, the work I and others um, in Richard Durbin's group and uh, some other groups have been doing on the geno genomics of adaptive radiation across the Lake Malawi cichlid radiation. And so before I even get started, like I said, I am gonna talk about a lot of other people's work. So, um, you know, I'm quite grateful too. So first I'd like to point out um, Bosco and Richard Zatha in Malawi, who are our other half um, of this collaboration. They, and um, they're who we work with in Malawi, and both really awesome guys, and they've taught me a lot. Um, Hannah Mumbi, who has really led all of the Masoko work, along with Amelia and Joel, um, but spearheaded most of that. And Margarita Samborskaya, who's led all the um, Maylandia work. And then Amelia and her student, her grad student Joel, who um, Amelia has a lab in the zoology department at Cambridge. Here, uh, and um, she's also been kind of leading a lot of the Masoka work, certainly all of the experimental work. So these are, like I said, the real stars of the show today, and I'm just presenting on their behalf. So I'd like to kind of start with just telling you a bit about the place that I'll be talking about, and um, that's Lake Malawi in Malawi in East Africa. Um, it's it's a quite big lake. It's actually about mm, five, close to 600 kilometers long. Um, uh, so quite large. And it's been over geological time, a very dynamic system. Over the past, I guess, 4.5 million years, it uh, is when it first had deep water conditions. And subsequently, it's nearly dried out a couple times and then had some, at least a couple other major drops in um, 
depth. So it certainly has not been any kind of static environment on an evolutionary time scale. And what's going on there? Well, um, I guess a lot of people might know already that uh, these African Great Lakes house some of the most kind of fantastic vertebrate uh, adaptive radiations that we've seen. And so what is an adaptive radiation? It's this where you have one lineage um, diversifying into many uh, other species quite rapidly. And so Lake Malawi and Lake Victoria sustain some of the highest rates of these vertebrate speciation known. And if you look among or between the lakes, you do see convergence in body plan, suggesting while demographic effects like um, population splits and isolation when the lake has dried out and recolonization and hybridization plays an important part. This convergence probably suggests that natural selection is playing an uh, important role as well as sexual selection as you can see because of um, all, many nuptial traits. So um, in Malawi in particular, Lake Malawi, which is <clears throat> where I've been working since I joined Richard's group, there's hundreds of these hapacormine cichlid species there, and they've all formed over the last million years. Uh, and they pretty much into these seven clades that you're seeing here on this evolutionary and this tree um, that corresponds to this colored cladogram. The colors match up, and I'm just putting this here because I'm going to show that a lot. And a very important point to note is that a lot, there's a lot of shared polymorphism in Malawi. Um, so, you know, as this plot here is showing from um, Malinsky's publication, I should have written that um, from Milan Malinsky, he found that, you know, there's, there's actually quite substantial overlap, or there is overlap between, you know, the degree of divergence even within populations as there is between species. So, it's just there's a lot of shared polymorphism is the is the big takeaway and so like i said you can kind of characterize the radiation into seven major clades and here i'm just showing them now for instance you have the um ramphochromis which are some midwater uh, pelagic pisivores and uh, here you have this big big group of the imbuna which are these more sedentary uh, rock gulling fish that uh, stay close to the shores. The generalist clade of Astatotilapia calyptera that you'll hear about more, etc. So one thing that I should mention that has kind of enabled all this work, and one of the things why it's nice that I get to talk about this because, you know, um, I'd like feedback on how to, <laughs> you know, think about these things. Um, about analyzing this data set. And this data set that I've been analyzing is this. Um, lately, we've been working a lot on generating a fairly comprehensive uh, genomic whole genome data set to basically understand the evolutionary uh, dynamics and genetics of the Lake Malawi radiation. So it's this comprehensive variant call set consisting of 2,200 individuals representing 14 genera and 269 species of quite high quality. They've been mapped to a high quality reference genome, a, new, a fairly new reference genome, and most individuals are sequenced to you know, 10 to 15x. So quite high quality for a data set this large. And so this is kind of what we're trying to wrap our heads around, how to use it to really you know, um, understand the, the adaptive radiation that's occurred. And so, as you can see, there's clearly a lot of um, phenotypic diversity, both uh, between species, you know, there's clear differences in head, head and body shape, there's differences in teeth, and there's differences in morphology, even among uh, populations within species. So there's just a lot of variation. And so that's kind of the observation. And, you know, I'm interested in the, of course, the genetics underlying these differences. And so one thing we could do, we have all this data, we could go and analyze these things um, piece by piece, which is what we've sort of been doing. Like I said, we just really got this all set together into a usable shape, I feel. So what I'm gonna talk about is actually 
my first kind of pilot run of thinking about how to analyze it um, as a whole. Uh, you know, so we could kind of dissect pieces and parts of it, but you know, what it would be appealing, I think, is to be able to kind of sweep the whole radiation, kind of like you would in a you know divergent scan to map genes between a couple species by comparing you know pairwise species, um, but sweep the radiation for signatures uh, for allele frequency distributions that are kind of abnormal or outliers, things that wouldn't be explained, um, signatures of divergence that wouldn't be explained across the whole radiation by, you know, the background structure and, and demography. And um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to do. And so a starting point, the first thing I thought about is just, or, you know, uh, looking for, um, kind of like an FST, well, essentially an FST scan, of looking across the radiation for SNPs with unusually high frequency variation across the whole radiation. And so kind of the, diver so I'm basically, I've been doing a divergent scan across the radiation. And I've been using this divergent score, which is really just the, um, to find outliers, which is really just the pairwise FST T between um, the many, many, pairwise population comparisons and that has some appealing properties because those pair if the comparisons are pairwise you eliminate a lot of assumptions and the uh they're them being chi square distributed is pretty fairly well met i found so the mean of those you know is is this gamma approximately gamma thing where with larger sample size is normal and so I can generate this distribution of uh, divergent scores, and then in a, a fashion similar to Whitlock and Waterhaus, kind of um, fit the core of this distribution so that I can come up with, really identify outliers and um, calculate uh, FDRs and such. But so right now I've just been focusing in a purely outlier kind of approach um, based on these divergent scores. Uh, and so I've ran this over the radiation, which I should say consisted of 33 species. So they were the, they were all the tips represented in that topology that I showed earlier, and I'll show it again. But um, I ran it over 530,000 um, high quality SNPs, um, and they represented about 14 and 14.5 thousand different genes, annotated genes. And then I was interested, okay, so I have this, these outliers in these unusual sites to cross the radiation in terms of being divergent across the radiation, so fixed difference. And I should say one of the rationales behind doing this is we were finding, because there's so much shared polymorphism, that some of the most promising signals when we were analyzing particular lineages and whatnot were fixed differences. So that's what made us kind of think of maybe high divergence is what we should be looking for. And if I do a, G, a gene ontology uh, overrepresentation test on these outliers, the I get 45 um, enriched Go terms, which are to me seem quite promising. They are for um, their terms that I would think would be influencing if I had to guess what kind of genes would influence the generating the differences in body plans and all that. It's things like anatomical structure development and many developmental genes, um, which I see over representation for. And that that's what I'm showing here in this in this network. So you have you know high enrichment of this developmental process term, which leads to things like anatomical structure development, regulation of developmental process. Um, amongst these outliers. And then there's cell-cell adhesion, which of course, you know, that doesn't jump out to me as what that might be doing immediately. So I'll revisit that one later, but pursuing this way, you know, this promising signal of these developmental um, genes. And then what I've done is, so you, so now I have these, let's say I have these, uh, well, I had a set of 300 SNPs. Um, or belonging to 300 genes actually that were um, in, enriched in the GO category anatomical structure development. And what I'm, and what I'm interested in is 
so are the patterns, the allele frequency distribution patterns at these loci then different than the radiation uh, as the in the background, um, things that wouldn't be influenced by selection. And so generated some null hypotheses. So basically I'm looking for repeated motifs of structure of hierarchical di divergent structure within these outliers. And, you know, if there's any hopes of that this would work, of course, I need to know what to expect as in the background. So that's why I generated these controls, which you're seeing above. And I really don't see any topological structure. I mean, there are, there are cases where things where, oh, so I should say this is a bi-clustering approach. I've, I've done some bi-clustering analysis to look for um, bi-clusters of genes, uh, which, or SNPs, which would be along the y-axis of these plots and, and species. Uh, are the columns. And you find situations, you know, with uniformly low, let's say, derived allele frequency expression or uniformly kind of intermediate allele frequencies across the distribution. But you don't get, like in the cases, the case situation, like my, in, among my candidates, some, some real distinctive structuring. So you do get these significant um, structure in these bi clusters uh, for let's say here this bottom left one is all the deep the deep clade um, are fixed differences between the deep clade and the utaka kind of benthic clade um, for the derived allele so that's kind of promising that there is this unusual structure there that you wouldn't expect just from the background and then taking this subset further of these 300 developmental genes, look at the ones in the significant bi-clusters and see kind of what aspect of development do they influence. And that's what I'm showing here. So it's a bit encouraging. There's things that there's, um, you know, certainly genes like in this first uh, poem here that uh, influence skeletal development, nervous system a lot, visual system seems quite important, vascular, heart and brain, I would say, are the, are the main ones. So kind of just things that would influence overall body plan. And one of the things, I mean, I have to admit, I'm, I'm quite interested in structural or in skeletal genes because I think that could be playing a big role in generating body differences. So I was happy to see that half of these skeletal genes directly dictate the development of the aspect of the skeleton is the is the skull and the jaws. And jaw morphology is thought to be very important in the niche uh, diversification amongst the cichlids. And then furthermore, what's kind of promising is that there's actually amongst these divergent bi-clusters, there is overlap in the genes. So um, bi-clusters found, uh, there's overlap in these divergence patterns and these divergence patterns at genes that I think are quite interesting. So things like this MDST1A, which influences craniofacial skeletal development. Um, and so these, I would say, you know, waving my hands and up, these are a good place to get started. You know, these are basically what I want to investigate more. I think I've, you know, these are generating sensible candidates. Um, so this is kind of an, an exploration on what, how I've been thinking about this so far. So what kind of have I learned from this so far? And this is this brand new work, but it looks like there are loci showing exceptionally high low frequency variants across the radiation that are enriched for biological processes. That could um, certainly generate the kind of diversity that we see. And that SNPs belonging to a real frequency pattern motifs that differ from the background that aren't accounted for by the background, at least in terms of based on my controls. Um, there are shared between divergent patterns across, there are SNPs that are shared between divergent patterns. Um, and these might, you know, be particularly instrumental important genes for uh, targets of selection across the radiation. But now it's time to kind of take those genes and really scrutinize them more for other signatures of, of selection. And so now I kind of want to take, that was looking at the, you know, a holistic approach to the radiation. And now I want to look at the work that we actually started doing initially more on particular uh, 
areas of the of the divergence. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about some uh, work in the national park in the southern part of the lake, where I it was um, the the context it was a species introduction, um, and really what I was or a species translocation, and really what I was interested in was to investigate how translocated populations adapt to new environments. Um, you know, what genes and what traits are important, and is hybridization with the native species playing an important role in promoting the adaptation? And so, like I said, this species, Sinotilapia zebroides, was introduced into the National Lake Malawi National Park. Um, and these are in Buna, I should say. Um, and they were introduced about 13 to 20 generations ago, so fairly recently. Um, and in the early 90s, there was some natural history observations that it looked like they were starting to hybridize with the native Maylandia zebra. Um, and so we went in, and there actually had been some early microsatellite work. Um, a while ago by Hastings Zidana to show that it looked like there was evidence of admixture. We went in with the whole genomes and confirmed that. So I'm showing here in this admixture plot, this, uh, the sino it looks like we find um, asymmetric integration of the native Melandia zebra into the sympatric introduced Sinotilapia zebroides. Um, and that was consistent with earlier results too. And then we have statistical support of that through Ababavitas. And so then of course with the genomes, you wanna ask, okay, so is that distribution, is there a distribution of this integration material that looks like it could be adaptive? And to do that, you know, one thing you might do is look for regions of low absolute sequence divergence in the species that could be hybridizing. But in the cichlids, that's so kind of a, a DXY scan. And in the cichlids, that's actually quite difficult because of the high degree of shared background. You get a lot of false, po of shared polymorphism. You get a lot of false positives and it's very noisy. But if you leverage, if you kind of tweak that DXY scan to cater it such that it, you introduced other populations, which we had, um, and you look for essentially sequence sharing that is exclusive between the sympatric species, and then this score becomes stronger as that as that shared sequence is more different from the uh, from the other populations anywhere else. And so this we use this modified DXY scan, and that gave some promising results. These kind of clear troughs, which is what we had hoped to see in this kind of scan. And if we look at what the genes look like, or you know, what kind of genes do these outliers correspond to, there are things you know, that are influencing eye development, heart morphogenesis, you know, some more light perception, uh, more eye development. So actually some functions that were quite consistent with you know, traits that seemed important from the overall divergent scan. And if you look like, let's say for instance, at the haplotype structure, let's say I'm just gonna take this peak here. This is what it looks like. I mean, it's pretty clear where here's the zebra, the native zebra, here's the introduced sympatric zebroides, and they're sharing a, you know, a nearly, you could say, sort of fixed looking haplotype, you know, exclusively. That is very different from zebroides anywhere else. So those are kind of a pretty strong pattern that it could be, a, you know, some kind of adaptive integration because it's, it's exclusive to the sympatric species and it's risen to quite high frequency. And the interesting thing like I'm showing here is that a lot of time at these, at these uh, peaks or troughs, like I'm gonna just show the first one, if you do some kind of independent scans of selection, so look for patterns of genetic variation that are consistent with selection or selective sweeps, uh, you find that either in the native or the introduced species at the at these low size. So here I'm just in the native zebra at this region that looked to be adaptively integrated. There's you know a sweep finder peak right 
centered on where this core haplotype is. And I should say, this is, does look like recent introgression because these are big, big blocks, but I'm just, but I can kind of narrow it down to what I think the core block is, which is what I'm showing. So like, for instance, what this would convey is that it looks like there was a locus that was adaptive for the native species, Sinotilopia got introduced, and um, now the native species intergressed that adaptive allele, and it's, which it shares highly with the native species, and it's rising to quite high frequency in the native, or in the introduced species now as well. And again, it's something that's quite different from the haplotype you see anywhere else. Um, kind of same story. This time you see a you know signature of uh, selection in the adapt in the introduced species. So what I'm going to say there is kind of the takeaway from what I learned from the national park is that comparing this absolute sequence divergence between sympatric and non-sympatric populations looks to be like it could be an effective way for scanning for adaptive integration. Um, and I did find 10 good candidates, I think, for adaptive integration related to functions like diet, anatomical development, and light perception um, that show evidence of rapid integration in the introduced species. Now I want to go down up uh, north to the lake and show you what um, really Margarita has been looking at. She's been focusing on the same kind of um, clay that I was, the one that involves the zebras and Sinotilopia, but she's been looking at various other Melandia species there. Um, and the first thing that she did was, you know, just do a lot of characterization of the genetic relationships among these species. But then she became quite interested in also these kind of species traits. So the outlier loci associated between different species groups that are kind of diverged, but beyond what the background drift would uh, dictate. And so these are the different species she's been working in. And, um, and so to do this, to kind of get at these genes that could be adaptive and important in the speciation process, she's been doing, because she's been working all in, within this Maylandia or, uh, group, oftentimes the, part of it is called the zebra complex, um, is comparing sister species, kind of just doing a, a GWAS of SNPs associated with species. So basically a divergent scan between spe sister species or groups. And the first one she looked at was involving Melandia zebra, or no, actually Melandia emeltos and Melandia fine zilberi. It was maybe an interesting place to start because there's been some gain and loss of like this red fin trait, but also because emeltos from Lorino Reef, one of the populations, it was called for the most part, the genetics and the taxonomy based on morphology line up quite well, but it was one case where it's actually more fine zilberry genetically, much more than it is actually uh, emiltos. Um, and so she kind of went in and played around to try to figure out what are the genes um, interested in, you know, what loci differentiate these species really. So what genes contribute to making a fine zilberry, a fine zilberry versus an emiltos, or this particular type of, let's say, emiltos. So she um, fit some uh, linear mix models, uh, comparing these groups, uh, treating species basically as a binary trait. And here's what she found. And the results are, you know, fairly striking in the sense that all of the highest, the the outliers in this scan, the most highly associated SNPs, which have very high FST, so big allele frequency differences between these groups, and definitely higher than, like I said, fixed differences are very, quite rare to actually see. Um, but all these genes, or uh, so five out of seven of them actually had very clear functions related to the visual system, so eye development and eye function. So again, we're seeing that these visual processes looks to be a very important thing um, in 
kind of the adaptive speciation process. And so, like I said, she kind of compared everything that was called a miltos from everything that was called fine silvery, and then the a miltos, so let's say aren't really a miltos to everything out, just to figure out what, you know, is making that. And she found some fixed differences. So in this top scan, she only found two um, in the whole genome, but they, uh, they're they all in this SLC24A2 gene, again, which has roles in eye development and or visual perception and um, also found similar fixed differences when she did this comparison in addition to some others uh, that showed um, actually some patterning to how the uh, fixed differences were distributed. So a lot of them were centered around these particular domains. Um, and the exciting thing is that, so she's finding these fixed differences and they are in these non, they're non-synonymous exonic changes. How they're changing the protein, I actually haven't looked at yet, but there are some kind of functional change. So it seems like a something promising to follow up on. And then another thing she looked at was comparing, she has all these barred species in this zebra complex. And then there's one lineage that looks like it had lost bars. So the, the patterning, and that's Colinus and Pearly. And so she, you know, this was just an interesting to see, case to see if she could find genes that could be responsible for um, uh, generating bars, which is something various people who have worked on cichlids have attempted. Um, and so again, she did a similar kind of binary trait analysis of pulling everything that had bars comparing to everything that had not bars. And her association scan pulled out, again, some the highest hits were these actual fixed differences between the groups. So, well, she found actually, the only fixed differences there were were these uh, five, yeah, five, five here that are circled. And one, we're pulling out one, and we're kind of just arbitrarily taking one because it looks like a quite good candidate for this kind of trait because it's, um, and that's Ka, which is, like I said, this fixed difference. It, and it has, its function is basically to uh, melanocyte differentiation and migration, which is a very good candidate because it's been shown that in fish, it's, you know, melanocyte migration that generates different kind of patterns, um, body patterns. And also the signatures, the genetic signatures around the kit A gene um, in her scan are consistent with something you'd see uh, with selection where she has a highly associated SNP, then the some other uh, highly associated SNPs that are in high LD with the associated one right on the kit, kit A SNP. And then, you know, there are some suggestions of allele frequency. Uh, distributions that are also centered right on kit A. If she runs it in let's, this kind of scan in, in Colinus, the, the one of the taxa that you would have expected to have experienced selection for losing the bars, uh, there is you know some hint that there, the allele frequency patterns could be suggestive of selection. Um, and then she's also found that there are two fixed ex differences that are ex in the whole radiation that are exclusive to the non-barred species right next to, right outside of um, Ka. And so we're looking at that right now, whether it could be in you know, a promoter or something like that. So in summary from that, is we have very good candidate for what is causing bars, we think. And also, it, again, it, it's reinforcing the idea that visual perception genes are something that is pretty important amongst these cichlids in, in their speciation process. And lastly, I wanna take a vacation out of Masoko, or going, to, or sorry, out of Malawi, which would normally be a vacation to go there, but um, take a trip from Malawi up to Masoko. Um, which is a small crater lake in Tanzania. Uh, when I say small, I mean quite small. So only 700 meters wide and 35 meters deep. And 
where here we're going to focus on, like I said, this generalist Astatotilapia calyptera clade that inhabits this lake and is seemingly, or is, diverging into two distinctive ecomorphs, uh, a shallow and a deep, and a deep morph. And just to say, you know, there, it, there's not, a, it's not very speciose in terms of fish. There's three other species there. And I'll say right away again that this work has been led by um, Hannah and then uh, Amelia and Joel have also played a big role and are the ones leading the uh, experimental work. So what, what's going on in Masoko? Why is it a good setting to perhaps study ecological speciation? Well, one is because, like I said, there's this uh, the shallow, which we call littoral morph, and a deep morph. And they have diverged morphologically, both in terms of body color and head shape, body shape, and the pharyngeal jaws. Um, so for instance, relative to the bends, the littorals have a narrow, a more narrow slender head. Um, this PCA here is showing um, the colors are according to their catch depth. So what it's basically showing, these are the genetically benthic. They form a very distinct cluster. And then there's this littoral group. And basically what you can take away from this is that the benthics have a much more constrained, um, much more constrained roaming behavior. They, they stay deep. And, um, you know, structure wise, I've started to look at kind of demographically what's going on in Masoko. There's clearly these two different groups. And then there's what you could think might be hybrids in the middle. So um, in admixed individuals. And indeed, if you look at ancestry track link distributions um, in this middle group, there is evidence that there is recent um, ongoing admixture as ind indicated by quite large uh, ancestry tracks that are either benthic or littoral. But there's also um, quite a appreciable degree of exclusive sharing of recent mutations, suggesting that it might not be just a completely transient hybrid population and which could also explain a bit this U shape um, and this dip in the PCA along the second component. Um, so there is actually some suggestion that there is a somewhat stable also middle population that th there is a lot of gene flow from the littorals and benthics, but they could be, um, there is some degree of assorted of mating. And so what did Hannah find? She found some quite cool stuff. And basically it's that there are multiple sex determination systems in Masoko. So fish or cichlids don't have distinct sex chromosomes. They have loci on the autosomes. Um, there's other mechanisms as well, but loci on the autosomes uh, mainly that act as the sex determiners. And so what she did, it, and it, it's also, there's a notion uh, people have showed that sex determination systems have a quite high turnover rate and evolve quickly in these African cichlids. And what she showed by doing some serial GWAS uh, on um, with, where the response was, was sex, she mapped uh, loci that were highly associated with sex and found three different sex loci. A primary sex locus um, on, so I should say these, t these ones that are labeled GSDF are both on chromosome 7, and this one in the middle is on chromosome 19. Um, and, and, and so, okay. uh, and so this first locus she found is the one, is the locus that's primarily, it's an XY locus that's the one that's primarily used lake-wide. And the mechanism is actually as indicated by these co this coverage plot here. Uh, and sorry, this should be GSDF, or, or this should be gonadal, gonad gonadal somatic drive factor. But this top plot, it indicates that at, there's a duplication spanning this GSDF gene. And GSDF was a gene that was speculated to possibly being a sex determiner, though it wasn't ever really, um, figured out, but that was the speculation. And now we can, with pretty 
strong confidence say that, yeah, the, it's this GSDF gene and the actual mechanism is it's a duplication to generate this XY system. And that's the pr primary mechanism operating in the SOCO. And it's, and, and it's an old system as evidenced by, we, that we can find that duplication and it having a role sometimes in sex outside of Lake Soko in the other Malawi fish. The, um, the interesting thing is that it's a sex determination system that is exclusively used in the benthics versus the littorals, which use that system plus the two others. So the other, uh, there's another one on GSDF that is not associated with any kind of structural variant, the other sec, uh, allele, sex determining allele, which is also an XY system, and another XY system on chromosome 19. And so all three are used in the littorals, um, but only the, uh, the duplicate GSDF gene in the benthics. And here just showing, it looks if we look at a plot of the association of the secondary GSD, GSDF focus on chromosome seven, it suggests a much newer versus the, the, the duplicate, a much newer uh, sex determination system as evidenced by, you see this long range LD around the highly associated SNP, suggestive that it's new and is experiencing selection generating this hitchhiking effect. And then, um, so moving on from the sex, then there's another trait that we were interested in that uh, looking at in Masoko, uh, initially in interest of uh, Amelia, is egg spots. And egg spots are a, thought to be, a, or in, likely are a quite important trait in um, cichlid uh, diversification, certainly in sexual selection. Because the way the egg spots work is, um, Cichlids are mouth brooders, so they brood the eggs in their mouth. And so the males are the ones who really have, generally who have, you know, the distinctive egg spot patterning on the anal fin. And um, females, they think they're eggs. And so they go up to collect the eggs in the mouth. And that's when the um, magic happens. You know, everything gets fertilized that way. And so that's what. Uh, and there are certainly differences in this phenotype within Masoko, um, whereby the benthic individuals tend to have fewer spots with a higher contrast. And we could hypothesize that that's because of the visual environment. If you go down deep in the lake, it's much darker and murkier than the clear, shallow waters. And so having higher spot contrast might make the egg spots more visible so there might be selection for that and so we were interested in what are so there's phenotypic difference between the ecomorphs at these egg spots so we want to know what are the genes that um, underlie egg spot formation and one g was we ran, ran was on the spot intensity so the color of of the egg spot and our highest associated SNP is a very good candidate uh, it's CDC42, where it has various functions, but one of them is in um, melanosome transport. Um, and it's been shown experimentally to influence color phenotypes. So it seems like a lead. So we're investigating that for um, egg spot color. And the again, the signatures, the linkage signatures of the associated of the other associated SNPs are suggestive that there's been selection acting on it. And then for spot number, um, our GWAS, we see um, three, or, or, or among our top three, so being this RSF11 gene, this DL gap gene, and then we have OCA2, which is the third strongest associated SNP in this scan for spot number. Um, OCA2, again, we're pursuing that because it does have a strong association. Um, and it's a very plausible gene for influencing spot number because 
it functions in a writ for differentiation in melanin biosynthetic processes, uh, things that we know uh, underlie uh, egg spots, pro biological processes that generate egg spots. And we can see, again, LD patterns consistent with selection at neighboring SNPs, also, they're also highly associated. And the pattern, we do see a real pattern of uh, allelic dosage and spot number. There is a correlation. However, I should say that one thing that's a bit perplexing at this point is that the allele frequency at this highly associated SNP between the ecomorphs is essentially the same. Um, and so it, it doesn't seem to be maybe the locus that is generating the observed difference in the spot numbers. Um, so that's a consideration, but we think it is in one of the genes underlying spot number development. And so Amelia and Joel have developed some CRISPR knockouts to follow up on this OCA2 lead. And um, it's still very early days in assessing what how it's working, but with the little that we do have at this point, it looks promising. Certainly the knockouts are showing pigmentation differences relative to the wild types, but um, I have to stay tuned to figure out uh, what develops from that. And so what did we learn from Masoko? Really that there's multiple sex systems in this small lake that confirm that kind of support the idea of rapid sex determiner evolution um, and what's very interesting is how the sex uh, determiners are being used differentially between the divergent ecomorphs so now we're wondering is this somehow playing a role in the in the uh, divergence process um, and then we have two strong, strong candidates for genes influencing the egg spot phenotype. And so lastly, I'm just going to wrap up by saying, you know, taking all this together, all these different uh, branches of the radiation tree that we've explored, plus the overall scan, you know, it is what I found in the overall divergent scan, you know, lining up at all with what we found by exploring these separate avenues. And in general, it's looking like there is, you know, a, some fairly appreciable overlap. So from the National Park Study, here I'm looking if I take again the 95 percentile outliers, and here's the 99 percentile outliers. So in the 95, in the 95 percentile, I re, I get I find there's overlap in almost all the genes that I found from the National Park Study, and still quite good overlap. Um, in if I'm more strict with the outliers. Also find in the nine, some overlap in the Maylandia study, but none in the, if I crank it up to just the smaller subset. And then also we find overlap in Masoko. So this is promising that, you know, the genes that I'm finding with this overall radiation allele frequency divergence scan there is intersection with these uh, independent avenues we've been exploring. So kind of in conclusion, taken as a whole, um, at this point, I mean, it's just been a lot of fishing at, right now and, uh, you know, data exploration more than anything. Um, but we have produced a set of candidate genes that we think are playing a large adaptive role within or across the sets of Malawi cichlid lineages. From the National Park, we can tell that hybridization hybridization looks to play a role in promoting adaptation to new environments. Uh, a common theme is that genes related to vision or light response appear to be particularly important. Um, from Masoko, we have some strong candidates uh, uh, and, and um, Margarita's study for bar and barring and egg spots, so different um, pattern phenotypes. And then the radiation divergence scan is generating gene candidates that could underlie major aspects of morphological diversity, such as cranial facial structure and body shape through these early acting developmental functions, the genes related to that, that it's highlighting. So with that, um, you know, apart from the people who did the work, there's, you know, some other people I need to thank, namely um, 
Martin Jenner, uh, my advisor, Richard Durbin, Hannes, and um, George Turner, who knows so much about cichlids. All of them actually do much more than me, so but I'm learning. So anyways, uh, that would be it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tyler. It was a fantastic talk. And I'm sure there will be a lot of people clapping if we could. <laughs> uh, I think now uh, Jonas is going to handle the, the question session. Yes, okay. so everybody can now ask questions to Tyler, either through the chat here in Zoom or on Twitch. We'll keep an eye open. You can also raise your hand in the, in the Zoom here. Then you can, then we can unmute you and you can ask him more personally. But we have a question from Matthew who asked you, Tyler, if you can uh, talk a little bit about how you associate a slip to a gene, especially if the sniff falls far away from any gene, and if the cellular genes in the same neighborhood of a candidate SNP. Okay. I mean, right right now, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and I have a simple answer right now. I'm just taking the gene that only taking SNPs that actually fall within the gene or a thousand base pairs either side of it. If the difference is kind of split between a couple of genes at this point, I've been ignoring it. Um, I've been discarding it. Like I said, mainly because at this point, like I said, this is very brand new and it was mainly seeing if I could pull anything out of it at all that would look promising. So there's definitely some more sophisticated things that it need to do in terms of what associations I'm actually pulling out. But right now I've just taken a very naive but strict approach. All right, cool, thanks. Then we have another question from Roger who asked in the overall scan, do you see any co, uh, co variation uh, between the outlier SNPs? Uh, like do they tend to group together, uh, groups of taxa or are they all uh, the outliers behaving independently? Yeah, yeah. no, they do. Um, there is correlation. So that was something that I was particularly interested in. That's kind of what I was starting to explore with the bi-clustering and the interaction of the different SNPs uh, in the different bi-clusters. So um, yes, there is some correlation. I don't have a very good quantification of that, but it does exist. I do find it. But that's what that was the purpose of starting to like use these clusterings to find these motifs. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. And we also have a question from Fernando, who asks: uh, So you also find signatures of selection in the pigmentation genes uh, that we also see in other species uh, under selection, as in humans. And if you can tell with the signatures are concentrated in the same regulatory protein coding regions as in other species, or if the signal is too diffuse to tell. Sounds like a Fernando question. And of <laughs> course I can't answer it. Um, no, I mean, we haven't really dissected um, the genetic architecture around them is uh, if I'm understanding the question. I mean, um, that's what, that's on the to-do list right now. Uh, we don't really know too much other than that there is an association of that particular SNP and there's high LD consistent with selection, but not necessarily the architecture around it. Sorry, maybe we can talk more if I didn't explain that well, maybe I didn't understand. Thank you. So do we have any other questions? We just write in the chat, raise your hand. Yes, we have from Fatima. Do I have to do anything? No, I'm trying to. No, I was, I was struggling to, to okay. make myself unmuted. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the talk. It's a super cool project. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. One of them is, um, how do you actually differentiate the species? You say there's loads of polymorphism and a lot of overlap between populations and the species. Populations mm. of the same species and different species. So are you following some sort of taxonomic consensus? to, to uh, work with the uh, different samples as belonging to discrete species units? Yeah, so that, 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 that's another level of hierarchy that still need to work out. I mean, right now when I'm saying 
species, it's clumping all populations that are called, let's say, zebra, like Melandia zebra, all the different populations, they, I would consider them zebra. So it's they're just the names that have been classified assigned to all these different species mostly like I said based on taxonomy but not dissecting it at these finer levels which like I said is definitely relevant because the differentiation between populations of the same species can be you know as high as as between species but um, at at this as the first pass I haven't picked apart that that's more why we've been going in if we see uh, and exploring the different branches kind of on their own. And but that's, that's a system I've been using. Yeah, and then that I'm, I'm guessing that if you find some sort of ecological points in common, then that helps as well, pulling together samples of what could be the same species. If, yeah. you, if, if what you're looking is for the genetic basis of particular phenotypic traits. Mm -hmm. um, and and I was also wondering if you find, um, in terms of uh, just let's say genome evolution in general, do you find many gene duplications in general across these uh, uh, these species in these radiations? I you know I hadn't looked at we haven't looked at that um, in depth. So Hannah early on kind of looked at all sorts of classes of structural variations. Because we do think that structural variation in general has played an important role in you know, the rate of evolution that we see there. Duplications, I haven't done too much. I did run, I you know, kind of anecdotally, I did uh, look for duplications, bit evidence of duplication between, when I was working on those national park species, Sinotalopia and the, um, Maylandia zebra. And I did find, I mean, I certainly did find duplications, kind of species specific duplications that um, I didn't count how many. So, they, so they, yeah, I, I have found them, but I couldn't tell you much about how much there is. I, it is supposed to be an important um, mechanism in the evolution of these cichlids, though, and is something to look at important thanks yeah. thanks thank you all right then we also have another question from anas hey hopefully hopefully you can hear me uh thanks for a very very cool talk very a lot of really cool studies um in many of the different studies you use uh, uh very different um uh, types of uh, selection scans uh and they seem to vary from every study i don't i wonder if you can say something about what why you choose the different kinds of uh, selection scans. So when you use the pairwise FST and when you use the, the, the sweep finder and so forth. Um, I mean, it was, is there a method to the madness? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it, was, it was mostly madness. Um, I mean, the, the reason, I mean, the reason got interested, like I said, in these divergent scans is mainly just because a lot of these things, we don't find these fixed differences. And so we, when we do find fixed differences, if let's say we run something that looks for a difference, you know, some kind of skew in the spectrum like Sweet Finder or something like that, um, or, you know, run some statistics like Tejima's D, those are the loci that tend to jump out. So fixed differences seem to be kind of an anecdotal thing of, okay, this is interesting. So that's why I decided, you know, maybe that's something worth looking at because it had shown promise before. I mean, you know, just doing the basic divergent scans to look for species differences was just something that used to doing and then seeing if there's you know any kind of patterns within the populations that show that they could have been experiencing selection so i mean there's not really a i mean i've run other i've run other tests as well so things like you know more haplotype and linkage based scans like ihs looking for you know extended haplotype homozygosity all those kind of classes and i haven't 
and and they line up pretty well with you know things when i find a sweet finder result it, it generally lines up i think the big class of kind of selection scans that i that i want to and is what i'm going to do now later on is you know kind of dnds type scans mcdonald kreitman type tests to really leverage the multi-species composition of this data set i think those could be pretty powerful but yeah can I ask a, a, a clarifying question about the, your divergent scan, the one with the pairwise FST? So basically, yeah. you, you take the mean over lots of FST, normalize, I guess, by mm -hmm. the global FST. Yeah. And is there an assumption there that it's like a star uh, tree? Because uh, I guess you're not modeling the shared or the covariance. In the, yeah. In the yeah. I mean, no, so it, yeah, I mean, if you know, if you did like a multi-species FST and calculate it with them all in there together, so the the assumption is, you know, the scale, the FS, the per site, let's say FST scaled by distribution of FST when it's scaled by the genome wide FST is chi squared with the number of populations compared minus one. That's why when you do the pairwise comparison, it's just a chi square with one gray frame. That was a Lewinton and Krakauer, I think, result from a long time ago. And it's gone through all sorts of criticism, you know, about how well that approximation holds. It tends to hold quite, and you are assuming, when you have multi -species, multiple species, you are assuming that, you know, uh, equal divergence uh, from, so a star like thing from the ancestor, but you know, you don't have to worry so much when you do the pairwise comparisons. So I was just doing them. So that's why I did them pairwise. And then they all do tend to follow a kind of high square one degree of freedom type distribution, the distribution of sites. And then it's just taking the mean of those. So it's something that's gamma or normal-ish. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any other questions for Tyler? I guess I can take one. Ah, yeah. um, it's a rather general, general question that maybe has no answer, but there is many examples of both adapted introgressions and adapted divergence in, in, the, in the system, in the different species comparisons. Have you seen there is any correlation to the type of traits that are more prone to adaptive introgression, uh, possibly, I don't know, physiological traits, and those that are more prone to adaptive divergence, maybe behavioral traits? Mm -hmm. No, I don't know, because I haven't looked. That is a very interesting thing. I'm gonna do that, because that, that's, that will be very interesting. I mean, one of the things that I want to do, now that I kind of generated a set of you know, candidates from this big radiation scan of things that just look not normal, um, and candidates in that sense, you know, looking, I want to look one, you know, are these things involved in the adaptive integration and adaptive divergence, but the, and relating it to those kind of patterns, you know, any kind of pattern that I could extract would be really cool to understand, right? Like, how these things are evolving or you know diversifying and so quickly uh, and so those kind of patterns i wouldn't be surprised if they exist but i haven't looked for them so yes. that's a good suggestion that's a good thought thanks thanks all right so if there's no further questions i think we once again want to say thank you very much tyler for coming on and talk. And thank you for everybody tuning in to watch the talk. Uh, and this talk will, has also been recorded and will be on YouTube probably later this day. So you can share it to your coworkers who couldn't attend. And we'll be live again with the fifth talk of our summer seminar series with Lucy. So we hope you'll join us again on Monday. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone.